And so a very important principle, just stepping back, when you look at cerebrovascular disease, anytime you see a problem, whether it's an aneurysm, an AVM, a cavernous malformation, is you take a step back and you say, what is the natural history of this problem? Which is going to predicate whether or not you watch the problem or whether you treat it. And then what are the treatment options if you decide to treat it? There are always options, uh, surgical options, endovascular options, not for aneurysms, but potentially for other cerebrovascular pathology. Radiation is also an option. And it's important to always think about them in this phase. Do I need to treat it or not? Then that's predicated on the natural history. And then what are my options if I decide to treat it? And that's going to totally guide this talk today. So uh, to stratify the discussion today, uh, we're going to talk about the different types of aneurysms. We'll really be focusing on saccular aneurysms. We'll talk about risk factors for their formation briefly. We'll spend a decent amount of time talking about anatomy that I hope will be fruitful for people at a variety of levels, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. And then, of course, the key factors, natural history and then treatment options. So... I like to think of aneurysms as stratified into four types. You have your saccular aneurysms. These are your typical aneurysms that occur at hemodynamic stress points. And these are the ones that are going to be the focus of this discussion for the remainder. But I do want to allude to dissecting pseudoaneurysms, which in extreme form are blisters. I'll have a one slide on that. Fusiform aneurysms, which are illustrated, is illustrated in the middle pane here. I don't know if you see my arrow, but this is a fusiform vertebral aneurysm, unfortunately, with the anterior spinal coming right out of it. And then finally, there are mycotic or infectious aneurysms that can occur. And again, the latter three are not really going to be the focus of this discussion. But just this, uh, to review and, and explain each one. So a saccular aneurysm, again, typically occurs at a hemodynamic stress point. It's a turn, and usually there's a branch vessel that's associated with that turn, right? So uh, typical uh, examples include the ACOM at the bottom left, the PCOM, uh, ophthalmic aneurysms, these are side, this, this is an example, a true example of a sidewall aneurysm. And then at the far bottom right, a basilar apex aneurysm, and that's a, a true bifurcation aneurysm that occurs at a, at a bifurcation of a main vessel. Uh, and, and again, these are going to be the focus of our discussion. We're going to evaluate each of these by location in general, in general and in detail. But it's important to emphasize that these are hemodynamic phenomena. They occur at hemodynamic stress points, typically it turns and there's usually a branch associated with them. Now, in contrast to that, a dissecting pseudoaneurysm is really a tear in the wall of an artery. There's not necessarily an associated branch vessel. Uh, and what can happen is the, the, the tear in the wall can enlarge and become a pseudoaneurysm. And you can also have some narrowing. So what you can see here in the figure uh, towards the top is there's a fusiform or dissecting aneurysm of the vertebral artery, distance of that, there's a stenosis. Now, to the right of that picture, you can see that I've treated the aneurysm using a flow-diverting stent that has remodeled the artery that's treated the stenosis, but also uh, led to occlusion of the pseudoaneurysm. Now, the extreme form, in my opinion, of a dissecting pseudoaneurysm or tear in the wall of an artery is a frank hole in the artery, or what we can refer to as a blister. A blister is typically diagnosed in the setting of a hemorrhage, and it's a often just appears as a tiny little bump in the artery. That red arrow is showing the blister. These are also treated with these flow diverting stents uh, to basically treat them. And again, another final type of, of aneurysm that won't be the focus of this discussion are mycotic aneurysms. These are infectious aneurysms that occur. They can occur anywhere, but also but can occur in the cerebral vasculature. So what happens is typically an infected embolus lodges in the blood vessel. Uh, this infected embolus all, often occurs typically in the setting of endocarditis or septicemia. And then as the infection basically takes root in the blood vessel, the blood vessel can blow out and become an aneurysm and rupture. Uh, less commonly in the setting of meningitis or perhaps uh, with the arteries adjacent to sphenoid sinus, the proximal carotid artery, you can have direct contiguous spread of an infection uh, that can cause uh, a mycotic pseudoaneurysm, but that's far less typical. And again, the vessel just blows out. So this is just an example of a patient with a parietal hemorrhage and endocarditis. Um, it's very hard to see on the large angiogram, the zoomed out angiogram, but there's a distal M4 parietal mycotic aneurysm. You can see the zoomed up view when I have a microcatheter near it and we deposit some uh, liquid embolizate some onyx into it and then you can see the onyx occludes the vessel and then in the post-op that brightness is basically the onyx that's occluding the aneurysm. Hey,
everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.